Hello everybody, you're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. This is the weekly radio show where we chat about the local arts news. We have a different guest on each week. We head over to the Rylight Zone for a short story and or some poetry. We catch up with Twangling Jack Ford over in the Yorkshire for a weekly album review and we play local, unsigned and or independent music. As always, you can reach out to me here at the studio by dropping me an email on dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk That's D-A-N-E dot C-O-B-A-I-N at wickhamsound.org.uk I'm particularly keen to hear from poets, performers, musicians, anyone with MP3s, stories to share, local arts news, don't hesitate to get in touch. You can also find us on Facebook. If you search for the Hot Show on Wickham Sound, you should be able to find us. And we're repeating on Wickham Sound on Monday nights. We're on the Wickham Sound list again. We're on iTunes, Spotify, and wherever else you get your podcasts. So this week we're going to be chatting to author Amanda Bird, but before we do that we're going to head over to the Rylight Zone for the latest instalment of Formerly, The Rise and Fall of a Social Network. This is a novel by myself, Dane Cobain. We've been serialising it a chapter at a time over the past few shows. If you missed any episodes you can catch up, as I say, or you can get the ebook, paperback or audio book on Amazon or anywhere else. So here we go, Formerly, The Rise and Fall of a Social Network by Dane Cobain. Chapter 11 The boardroom was pretty crowded, like a busy photograph or a bad painting. It was small at the best of times, walled off from the rest of the office behind a glass partition. The glass was still damaged from the pirate party, when a journalist had tried to walk through it. We laughed at the time, but somehow it earned us a bad write-up and a glassware bill of nearly £800. We decided not to pay it unless we had to. I was pressed up against Flick and Abby, right in the corner of the room. We'd been through enough team meetings by now to know that the safest place to be was as far away from John as possible. He wasn't exactly scary, just unpredictable, and it was an open secret that sitting at the front might get you fired. Flick learned that the hard way a couple of weeks back, and she hadn't come into the office for days. She only came back because Kerry convinced John to apologise. The whole company turned out for the meeting. The original team had changed completely. By now, Abby and I were reluctantly heading up our own division of developers, although John was still the boss. The founders had no idea that Abby wanted to leave, and whilst I was happy to stick around, I wasn't ready for the responsibility. Unfortunately, neither of us had any choice. The two of us were walled into the boardroom by Niels and his men. They were part of the place by now, and we didn't even notice they were there unless they got in the way, which happened all the time. I still didn't think they served a purpose, but John disagreed. As far as I was concerned, their investigation had failed and we were just as vulnerable as ever. Elaine rounded off our motley crew, sitting front and centre on one of the half dozen chairs that skirted the boardroom table. The air hummed with idle chatter and the faint stink of body odour. Cleanliness is never a priority when you're trying to change the world. Then, John raised his hand for silence, Peter closed the lid of his MacBook, and the hubbub began to die down. Are we ready, boys and girls? Good. Then let's begin. When Peter and I created Formally, we had a vision, John began. We wanted to create a digital afterlife, a social network for the dead and for the living that they left behind. And that's exactly what we did, buddy, Peter grinned. For once, John didn't seem annoyed at the interruption. In fact, he gave his co-founder a brief high five before continuing. You're right, John said. That is what we did, and we did it well. From zero to half a million users in the first six months. Along the way, we hired our first developer. Abby has been with us since the early days, and his hard work on the back end got us to where we are today. Good work, Abby. You're welcome, boss, Abby said, as the rest of us launched into a round of applause. John smiled and waited for the applause to die down before continuing. With Abby on board, we started rolling out serious new features and cleaning up the code. We left our closed beta, launched to the public, and took on Kerry to shoot some tutorials and adverts. Kerry also cleaned up the UI and made the site look incredible. In fact, after we rolled out Kerry's first batch of updates, our conversion rates shot up and we started signing up new users at an alarming rate. By the end of our first year, we hit 8 million users and registered hundreds of verified deaths. But it wasn't enough. It sure wasn't, Peter agreed. Which is why we hired you, Flick. Flick grinned beside me and fired off a quick salute, which Peter returned half-heartedly. Flick joined us as our in-house marketing and PR whiz, John continued. See, Peter and I are the visionaries. We can build a decent product, but we need someone like Flick to spread the word. Flick used to work for a PR agency, so we knew we had to have her. When you cross her brain with Kerry's camera, you're onto a winner. She bought into our vision and has worked tirelessly ever since to make us the fastest growing social network this side of the pond. Good work, Flick. Thanks, boss, she replied. But you forgot to mention that I'm the office manager too. Someone's got to keep things running. Of course, said John. You're right. That's been a big part of what you've done for us. 
But you're more useful when you're pimping us out than when you're ordering the shopping and emptying the dishwasher. So guess what? We've got news for you. We're hiring another office manager, a proper one. She'll take all of the off your hands so you can concentrate on PR and marketing. Sounds good, said Flick. When does she start? Well, that depends, he replied. We need to find her first. For now, just remember that we appreciate what you're doing. In fact, you made such a difference to the company that we had to hire Dan, our second developer. I smiled but said nothing. I hate being the centre of attention, and I always have done. Luckily, John continued his monologue and all eyes returned to the front of the room. When Dan joined, things really started shaping up. He took over a lot of my duties, which allowed me to spend more time with Peter working on our strategy. We've got a lot to share with you, but that comes later. Until then, let's just say that if Dan hadn't joined us, most of you guys would be out of a job. Dan and Abby here allowed us to start to develop our development team, and with a bit of luck it will keep on growing as we add more features and branch out to new platforms. But so far, said Peter, we've only looked at the positives. There are downsides to running a business, like espionage. Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you something that might surprise you. One of you is a spy. After Peter's accusation, nobody moved for a full five seconds. It was clear from glancing around the room that this wasn't a revelation to his co-founder, but everyone else seemed shocked. Flick looked like she was ready to cry. That's right, said John, breaking the silence. One of you has been leaking information to the press, and to God knows who else on top of that. We think we know who it is too, but first, has anyone got anything they'd like to say? An admission of guilt, perhaps? No such admission was forthcoming. Most people just looked confused, but a couple of the newer members of the team were seething at the accusation. I wasn't surprised. Formally is a labour of love, but it doesn't treat you kindly. People usually either left within three months or stuck with it till the bitter end. Fair enough, John said, but don't say I didn't warn you. Graham, step forward, please. Obediently, one of the junior developers stood up and made his way to the front of the room. Graham, do you deny that you've been opening that big mouth of yours? Someone's been leaking our movements, someone from inside the company, someone with more brains than sense. No comment, he replied. You can say what you like about Graham. He was lazy, inept, and a But the guy had balls. John looked ready to punch him, and if looks could kill, then Niels would be well on the way to a jail cell. You can do this the easy way or the hard way, John said. Leaking our movements was just the start of it, wasn't it? See... We figured something strange was going on when journalists showed up at places before we even arrived, and when people started writing about new features before we released them. It's funny, that. Ever notice that none of those features got released? Graham, Peter said calmly, we're not stupid. Why do you think we were never dumb enough to trust you with anything more than making widgets and happy plugins? It's hard not to notice that the only features that ever got leaked were the ones that you came up with, or the fake ones that we've had you working on over the last six weeks. Where else would they have got that information? And here's the funny part. We're not even going to use them. No comment, he replied. Who have you been talking to? John asked. There was no response. You know how tight security is, Graham. You must have known that you'd get caught out. So why did you do it? Was it for the money? No comment. We could have given you more. You could have changed the world with us, Graham. Now you're barely even fit to be a user. Get out of here and don't come back. And don't even think about taking your machine. You're not going to need it where you're going. Whatever you say. Graham replied. It's been fun. And that was that. Graham was ushered out of the room without any fuss, and John continued his speech about the importance of loyalty to the company. It was a moving speech, but I didn't pay much attention. Flick nudged me shortly after Graham's exit and nodded in the direction of the doorway. One of our security guards, the big one with the cauliflower ears and a scar on his upper lip, was skulking into the room with a lopsided grin on his face. I had a bad feeling about the guy, and besides, he kept massaging his knuckles. I knew firsthand how the founders hated to lose, and John seemed like the kind of guy who'd tell the world about his website whilst his heavies put the pressure on anyone who opposed him. So let that be a warning, John concluded, jerking me back to reality. We will not tolerate indiscretion. Security is of paramount importance, and we can't afford to leak anything, whether you're talking to the press or whether you're chatting about your day to the wife and kids. Dan, you need to be more careful than most. Your girlfriend is a journalist, right? She is, I replied. She's one of the enemy. But we don't talk about work. In fact, we don't really talk about anything. Good, John replied. That's how it should be. The same goes for the rest of you. Keep your mouth shut or I'll be showing you the door. Are we clear? As one, the employees murmured a grumpy acquiescence. It was enough for the two founders, who smiled. Good, said John. That's what I was hoping for. Niels, sweep the room and lock it down. I want no electronics in here. 
It's time for a private announcement. It took Niels and his men a good 20 minutes to scour the room for bugs, but we weren't complaining. We finished off the last of the pizza, cracked open a couple more beers and chatted amongst ourselves whilst we waited for the room to be secured. Turns out that we're basically an honest bunch. Once we knew the rules, we were all more than happy to hand over our equipment, and the search of the room turned up nothing but a faulty router. Truth was, we all wanted to hear what John had to say. At last, John was satisfied. Sorry about that, he said, but we can't be too careful, and you'll be glad you stuck around. Go on with it, Flick murmured, so quietly that only I could hear it. I could feel the thrill of her breath on the back of my neck. You've probably noticed that Elaine has been spending more and more time in the office, John continued. As of next Monday, she'll be joining the team full-time. We simply can't get by without her. There's too much money flowing in and out of the business, and we need to keep track of it. According to Elaine here, at one point we were three weeks away from defaulting on our payments, and that just won't do. Elaine will be joining us five days a week and bringing everything into shape, which brings me on to our next news. Peter, it's your contact. Want to take this one? Sure thing, he replied, climbing carefully out of his chair. Now, as many of you know, I'm not in the office much. Half of you think that I'm skiving, which is partly true, but that's not the full story. For the last six months, I've been checking out the competitive landscape and meeting with potential partners, suppliers and investors. So you've been skiving? Flick asked. Peter looked across at her cautiously. It's true that I take a lot of people out to dinner, he conceded, but we think it's a worthwhile investment. Either way, it paid off. I can't give you the exact figures, but I can tell you that we're looking at an eight-figure investment from a coalition of venture capitalists. Just got real, guys. We're looking at one of the largest transatlantic tech deals in history. Let's get out there and show the rest of the world what we're made of. John and Peter hadn't finished. Far from it, in fact. But first they had to deal with an unexpected backlash from the staff, starting with Flick. What about us? She asked. I don't know about everyone else, but I've invested time and money in this company. I'm not so sure about taking on extra investment. Do we really need it? Is it worth having some idiot in the valley telling us what we can and can't do? We thought about that, said John, and we think we've come up with a solution. Good, because if the deal's already signed, it's too late for you to change it. No one's changing anything, Peter said. You'll still retain your shares, and they'll be worth even more by the time you sell them. Besides, we've cooked up a deal where John and I will retain full control of the company, so there's no need to worry about that. The contracts look legit, so take it easy and enjoy the ride. I'm not convinced, murmured Kerry, stroking the stubble on his chin, and I don't like it. Understood, said John, but sometimes there are things that we need you to trust us on. We can't tell you everything. In fact, the less we tell you, the better. Formally is built on secrecy. Just how many secrets are there? I asked. Loads, Peter replied. And we're about to tell you another one. As you might have noticed, Peter's been spending a lot of his time in Palo Alto, John said. It's a techie's paradise over there. You can find anyone and everyone from coders and marketers to investors, advisors and specialists in startup and immigration law. You can also find a lot of busboys and waitresses with broken dreams, Peter added. But that's the nature of the business. You either make it or you don't. Everything else is just borrowed time. Thanks for that, Pete. Always the optimist, said John. Always the realist, he replied. I'm just trying to prepare you guys for what's out there. Palo Alto is the city of broken dreams, but it's also the best place in the world to build a startup. Exactly, said John. And if it's the best place in the world to build a startup, it's where we need to be. Ladies and gentlemen, pack your bags. Formerly is moving stateside. His announcement was met with stony silence. I don't know about the others, but I was busy thinking about the practicalities, the hows, the whens and the whys. The two founders didn't seem surprised by the lacklustre response. Then again, John knew us better than our own mothers did, and Peter planned for everything. They already knew how we were going to react. Cheer up, guys, John laughed, breaking the stony silence. It's like you didn't hear me. I said we're going to Palo Alto. We heard you, John, Flick replied. We all watched her from the corners of our eyes, hardly daring to breathe. At times like these, Flick had an uncanny knack for picking up on the hidden thoughts of the rest of the group. But this isn't the first time you've made a big decision without us, is it? Flick, we're looking for loyalty here, John said. We told you all when you joined that Formerly would become your family. We'll take everyone who's willing to follow us, you can be sure of that. Peter's found a complex on the edge of town where we'll work, sleep and play. You went to university, Flick, am I right? Yes, boss, she replied. Graduated with honours. Then you know what to expect, John said. We're chasing the same vibe. We're all in this together, folks. That's right, Peter added. 
I can't wait for you guys to see it. It's got everything we'll ever need. There's even a gym, and we're throwing in food and accommodation. Sounds good to me, Kerry said. But I'm an American. Of course I'm down with moving back to the States. What about the rest of the guys? They have families. What are they supposed to do? We're your family now, John replied. But if you can't come with us, then you'll have to stay behind. You're better off working for us than for one of our competitors, even if you are on the wrong side of the Atlantic. This is too much to take in, said Flick. When's this all happening, anyway? I've already signed the lease, he told her. We fly over as soon as we get our paperwork straight. Flick, you'll be working on that as of today. Everyone, start packing up your belongings and speak to Flick about it. She'll arrange for them to be shipped over. What happens to the people who stay behind? Abby asked. John fixed his steely eyes on him and smiled. We'll be keeping the London office open as well. Anyone who can't make the move to Palo Alto can stay here with Elaine. London will double as our financial HQ and our international meeting place, but Palo Alto is where the fun will be at. Any other questions? Abby shook his head and a low murmur filled the air. John smiled and clapped his hands together. Good, he exclaimed. Ladies and gentlemen, get ready. We're moving to California. Who's in? That was this week's excerpt of formerly the rise and fall of a social network by myself, Dane Cobain, for this week's entry to the Rylight Zone. You're listening to The Archer on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound, and this is Fabulous Parfait with Jérôme Therapier. Uber à 19h, tu me prends en bas de chez moi. Tu donnes le nom de la boîte, de ces bébés transpirés. À 22 heures, toujours pas prêt à danser. Encore un peu trop froid, t'es qu'à ta troisième vodka. Lâche-toi, lâche-toi, oublie tes inhibitions. Lâche-toi, lâche-toi. Par les autres sans lasser Quand tu m'as invité J'espérais bien t'embrasser Et puis je me suis maquillée Exprès pour t'émoustiller Mais vu ce que t'as consommé Tu risques pas de remarquer Si j'attaque ma libu, tu m'achèverai la tête dans le cul. Trop tard le bip. Et puis je suis pas venu pour venir bourrer dans la rue. Les nez en désurgence, cache mon teint d'ingénue. Mais à se déhancher What the... Sauf que moi ton état Il est à ma volupté Yeah. 
Partying before that, we had Geronta PA by Fabulous Parfait. You're listening to the Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dan Cobain, and I'm here in conversation now with author Amanda Bird. The first question is, is a question I ask everybody, uh, which was, what was the last book that you read and what did you think of it? The last book that I read was a biography on Amelia Earhart. Cool. I don't, I'm not the biggest fan of things, and it was super dry. Either that or Amelia Earhart was, I guess, dry. I don't yeah. know. It was just, it bored me to absolute tears. So fiction wise, the last book that I read was The Witch of the Black Circle. That was fun. That was a lot of fun. Cool. And who was that by? Um, Maria DeVivo. Cool. D-E-V-I-V-O. Awesome. So obviously today I want to mostly talk to you about writing, which is why that, that book question is always nice. It's always nice to ask writers that because sometimes I get kind of I don't know, a musician or something or like a sound guy we've had. And sometimes they, they don't read as much. And writers obviously by their very nature tend to read quite a lot. Um, but I wanted I wanted to ask you how long you've been writing and how you got your start. I started back in 2015. So what is that? Seven years ago. Um, I was I was a writer for an automotive blog. And I also wrote the product descriptions for the website which it turns out is a whole lot easier than writing your own book description. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> I guess because you're so far removed from the products versus your actual work. Uh, so now my editor handles that for me. Um, but yeah, that's, that's how I got my start. It, uh, it all just kind of snowballed. I made a joke one day and then there was a panel in 2018 at a horror convention that's actually coming up this weekend. And uh, 
I made a joke again. Everybody just kind of stopped and looked at me and they're like, you need to write that. So <laughs> yeah, that's my current series. That is my current child. Awesome. And is, uh, is that the Brittany Cage series? Yes. So what yes. can you tell us about both Brittany Cage as a character <laughs> and also the series? So I'll start with the series because she's a little difficult to describe at times. Uh, the series is kind of like Vigilante Justice, but not in the way that you would think Vigilante. It's like the second part of the definition, I believe, um, where you know she just kind of takes matters into her own hands because she thinks she's making the world a better place. Not necessarily, you know, like, oh, this guy's a criminal. He needs to mm. die. Um, she kills guys, girls. It's usually um, each book is its own reason. Um, so hence 13 reasons for murder it'll be 13 mm -hmm. 13 books um she'll kill two people three people one person per book it just depends on her mood mm -hmm. i suppose and the writing process um and then she is a pain uh <laughs> <laughs> she's a pain there are times where she will be super quiet and other times where she will not shut up um I guess I'm lucky in the aspect that she has been super quiet during the onslaught that was that super dry biography, because I don't mm. know how I would have handled that. Um, as you can tell, I'm a discovery writer instead of a plotter. <laughs> um, she's, I don't want to give too much away, so I'm trying yeah. to figure it out here. Like, she she kind of idolizes Dexter. Um, she She definitely, like, agrees with what he does and why he does it. Because, you know, they're both making the world a better place. So she kind of sees them as similar, only there are huge differences between the two of them. Yeah. Um, not just going after criminals. Uh, there are significant personality differences. Uh, she's she's interesting. She dates cops. Um, it's, she's just a mess. <laughs> she's an absolute mess. That's the best way to describe her. She's fun, though. She's snarky. She's sometimes dry awesome and i think i read in one of your descriptions that you, you described it as the that like she collects people and i wondered if you think do authors collect people like britney cage does i think authors collect characters at least those of us that yeah no everybody we all collect characters <laughs> that's where i'm at on that we collect our our characters other people's characters just our favorite characters even if they're not ours we just we're character collectors yeah yeah, for sure. Yeah, no, that's a good point as a reader as well. I can see that. Okay, cool. And uh, how do you describe... As a reader, I'm a huge character collector. I will say that. Yeah. Yeah. So you're more of like a character-driven reader as opposed to a plot-driven reader? Um, Depending. Yeah. I think it depends. Cool. Like the plot doesn't have to be perfect as long as the holes aren't gaping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Okay, so how do you get the word out about your books? A lot of advertising. Um, which I've scaled back on recently. So instead of scaling back on the advertising, uh, come 2023, the plan is to ramp up the advertising as well as scaling back the conventions. Yeah. But I suppose, again, with your with your books, I mean, that's one of the nice things of having a series is, you know, if you can get people into one of the books, then hopefully they'll read through. Does you, hopefully, yeah. That's does your, the goal. Is your series like, because you kind of mentioned there, kind of, I suppose individual reasons for murder but is it one way you can dip into any book in the series or do you need to read them chronologically so you can definitely pick up anywhere uh, she has a tendency to spot her next kill at the end of the previous book so you're gonna want to go back and read everything like especially if you pick up book seven you're going to be like okay what is going on here i absolutely have to know what got her to this yeah. point so it's fun. I mean, but it's it, you could totally pick it up wherever. I've had people pick up book four and they're like, oh, now I need to read it all. So then yeah. they go back and, you know, binge one through three. So cool. And you described yourself as a character killer and a human remains director. <laughs> what, are you, what are the yes. best things about your job? The best things about my job is probably legally getting away with murder. Yeah. Um, and I get to be super creative about it. Like, in the beginning, it started off with kind of different disposal methods. And now she's got, you know, she's got everything down and she's like, okay, this is great. I know what I'm doing. And then she's got like her loves, like she's got a knife that she loves. She's got a couple guns, one of which is her favorite. Yeah. Um, she's 
it's just super fun to like kind of inject things or to, oh, look, I need to look this up and figure out how this works in real life. You know, how many pigs does it take a person or to eat a person yeah. and how long does it take? Um, fun fact, it's a week for oh, cool. two pigs. Nice. Awesome. Um, <laughs> it's about I a have, week. I have wondered pigs. that. Yeah. <laughs> I have done the research. Mm. Um, so, yeah, it's it's fun because it takes you into, you know, especially over here in the States, it takes you very firmly into NSA watch territory. Yeah, I was going to say it's one of those things. It's, it's that old cliche of the writer having the very incriminating Google searches. Yes, yes. Like some people are like, when I die, delete my search history. Yeah. And I'm like, nah, man, don't delete my search history. It's hilarious. That's funny. I had the exact same thing. I did a, a interview for someone's blog and they said they said that like, um, you know, when you die, what what do you think people, you know, or what are you going to do about your search history? And I was like, oh, just leave it up there. It'll confuse them. It'll be great. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, I I have searched chloroform and yeah. I can't remember what it was for. But then I found out that way, way, way back when in the early 1900s, they actually used chloroform to clean red wine out of white carpets. Nice. <laughs> I was like, so is that before or after the chloroform knocks you out? Yeah. Well, and that's the thing, because the thing about chloroform is, so I've read about that, and it's it takes like eight minutes to take effect or something. So it's like when you see people in movies, they put the cl rag of chloroform on, they go yeah. straight down. That's not how it works. And now every nope. time I see that in a book, it really winds me up. Uh, the other one is I saw on Mythbusters, they did a test where they had like their dummies or whatever. Because you see in movies, people get shot and they go flying backwards. But that doesn't yeah, actually that happen. Works. Yeah, that's not how it works. <laughs> And so when you see that happening in a book, you can tell the reader is just, they're a visual writer or whatever, and they're basing that on something they've seen in the film. And it winds right. me up so much. Every time I read it, I'm like, because I do a lot of book reviews, so I'll put a little sticky tab there being like, well, we've got to take this apart and explain <laughs> that's not how it works, you know? If anything, they might they might stumble backwards out of surprise. I'll, I'll give them that. Right. But... And there are people who, I mean, I've definitely read it, and I'm sure I've written it too, where we see it playing out as a movie in our heads. Yeah. So that's that's how we write it because we're like and then going back for whatever reason we're like oh damn did i actually write that what was yeah. i thinking yeah. you're listening to the art show on 106.6 fm wickham sound i'm your host dane cobain i'm here in conversation with author amanda bird and this is hoga's wolf with icarus Taking, been holding it in for so long, oh Lord, for so long. Brief glimpses of a future fast approaching the weight of the past. I'm winding, heading back to where I belong. She's free now, she's love. 
she's free love Let it go, let it lose, she's free now She's love She's free love Let it go, let it loose, let it go now. She is love. She is free. And she is love. And she is free. And she is love. And she is free. And she's free. That was Icarus by Hoga's Wolf. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and it's time for us to check back in with author Amanda Bird for this week's interview. Well, that's what editing's for as well, isn't it? So, um, and so you... And then you... my editor tends to let <laughs> stuff like that go on purpose. He's like, it's, it just adds to the fun. Yeah. And I'm like, it's because you see the movie in your head. Not yeah, everybody yeah. has that. And who who is... Well, who's on your publishing team in general? And obviously, who's your editor? Um... My editor's name is Jason Whited. He is amazing. I love him. I adore him. Um, he's probably one of my biggest supporters also. And of course, I make the joke. That's because I pay you to be. Uh, <laughs> he was shared with me by a friend about three years ago. And I haven't looked back since. Um, he's actually in the process of re-editing book three i dropped the ball yeah so he's in the process of re-editing book three so that'll be re-released back out into the wild by the end of november i think and then i'll start doing you know digital box sets and potentially paperback and or hardcover collections since as an indie box sets aren't what you think they are and if you list it as a box set on amazon they're like bad author no yeah (laughs) <laughs> awesome so i want to ask you and it might be it might, the answer to this might be the one you've already mentioned but uh who's your favorite fictional serial killer <laughs> it's a toss-up it's uh either dexter or hannibal lecter yeah <laughs> i thought i thought yeah. hannibal lecter for some reason i was like well he's got he's everyone's favorite really and he's just so like he's amazing he's, like, iconic but also i mean it's just it's an interesting like i guess like complex character as well because it's quite easy with serial yes. killers for them to become like you know, um, old school like villain cliche or whatever, and and I, I think yes. it sounds like what you've done with yours, you've made them into a more human character. They're not just they're kind of not just black and white. You know, she is very gray, and then yeah. there are the areas where she is super black and white. And we're not talking just like a basic black. We're talking the the darkest black yeah. you can get. She's like no, and then there's <laughs> other she, but she is definitely mostly gray. Like she has a heart, but she's also kind of an a hole. So yeah, yeah. Awesome, cool. So um, I wanted to ask you as well. Uh, you've got how many cats have you got? Is it just one cat? Have you got just just one, just uh, one. My little much? girl. She's actually in the window right now. She, what's she What's she called? Her name is Doctor Bedelia Du Maurier. So nice. if you've seen the Hannibal TV series, she is Doctor Bedelia Du Maurier is Hannibal's psychiatrist. Nice. So and I went into the shelter saying the first one to bite me comes home with me. Oh, cute, sweet. Yes, <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Okay, cool. Um, so a couple more questions. Um, so you, I, this is again, I've done done a little bit of research, been been reading around your website, and you mentioned on there that when you're not busy writing, you can be found playing video games. What games do you? What games sometimes, do you like? Um, I am a sucker for The Division Two. Sometimes a friend of mine coaxes me into playing Call of Duty, which I cannot stand. Um, occasionally, I get in with a group of friends and we play Halo. Four, I think it is. I haven't played it in a while and I'm so bad at it. They have to carry me the whole game, the whole round. Um, I'm not the best at PvP. <laughs> I used to play Neverwinter. Um, and I think the other big one I'm a fan of is Fallout 4. Cool. Awesome. And um, I guess building on that, because I wanted to ask you, you, I think you wrote a piece about uh, Driz- Oh no, this one on your Goodreads, Driz Doerden, whose name I cannot ever uh. say um what about what 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 is it about him that makes him so iconic Uh, 
aside from the fact that he's just been around for so long, um, it's fun because my my first interaction with him was back during the cleric quintet when that was still widely available. Um, and then I finished that quintet out and started kind of piecemealing things together, but I would mm. go with each separate trilogy. And it's just like the life that he's lived. Like it's so much fun to read this story about this, you know, 500 year old elf <laughs> and the, the fact that he walked away from everything that he's supposed to be, to be this better person. And he's, he's just amazing. The characters Bob creates are, are awesome. And I was lucky enough to establish, I, I can't say a friendship, but a, a good enough relationship with, with Bob Salvatore that, mm. you know, the, the conversations have been fun to awesome. say the least. Cool. Brilliant. Okay. Um, so what's the best bit of feedback you've received so far about, about your writing and your books or the best <laughs> review? My, my favorite one, I'm actually going to pull this up here because it cracks me up and I have it screenshotted because it makes me laugh all the time. It's on book four and she says something about deliciously twisted maybe <laughs> i'm getting to it now because it, it just makes me giggle every time oh it's it's actually the headline of it wonderfully sick <laughs> nice <laughs> you, have, yeah. have, you put, have you put that on any of your covers <laughs> uh i have not i do have inside the book it's like the first page i think where it's yeah. different things and i have not yet added that i probably should <laughs> Cool. Awesome. Okay. So I wanted to ask you about book fun as well, because that's where kind of I, I came across you. Um, and how useful have you found it, if at all, for kind of sales and subscribers for your newsletter? Um, it's super useful for subscribers. I have found it semi-useful for sales. I think my biggest problem is trying to weed out which promotions I should join versus yeah. the ones that I am joining. Um, and I'm super, super, super looking forward to the audiobook option as well, because mm. as I said earlier, I'm recording the audio. So fun times the and editing it, is probably the biggest challenge so far. yeah I, I was gonna say so I've, I've done that with one of mine as well and it's i don't know there's so many different things to be aware of like you need to get the right byte rate of the files and all bit rate sorry and all this stuff and um yes. and again it's just super time consuming but are, are you planning on doing that for like all of the books in the series yes Yes, that is that is the game plan. And if the readers turn around and say, "Okay, like we we love your commentary, but you kind of suck as a narrator," then I will obviously stop and I'll just do the commentary only. Yeah, cool. I'm good with that. Awesome. Um, so uh, just I've only got two more questions. So one of them is, uh, what's your best piece of advice for being an adult? <laughs> I don't it's a trend <laughs> um, I'm kidding. It's just funny because we were talking about this the other day, my husband and I, and I was like, you know. When I was younger, all I wanted to do was grow up. And now I'm yeah. like, oh my God, what was I thinking? Yeah. Um, best piece of advice for being an adult. I'll say something that I actually still sometimes have an issue with, and that's thinking before speaking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, fair enough. Cool. Okay. Uh, and I just want just to end on, um, well, it's kind of two questions in one, and you've answered one of them a bit. Um, first up, what's next for you? And where can people follow you to find out more? So what's next will be book eight in the 13 Reasons for Murder series. That is 13 Reasons for Murder Harlow. Um, Harlot, Harlow, H-A-R-L-O-T, yeah. Harlot, I think. Um, I was going to name it Whore, and then I realized how much of a pain that would be to try and advertise. Yeah. So Especially on Amazon. So I'm like, yeah, no, that's probably a bad idea. Um, and also an unnamed title and unnamed series. Um, I'm going to take women from history and turn them into serial killers in the day and age that they lived. Awesome. Cool. Yeah. And um, so I'm still working on that fun stuff and where to follow me. Yeah. Goodness. I'll just direct right to my website because all of the socials are there. So the website is Amanda bird, B Y, <clears throat> excuse me, B Y R D dot net. Big thank you to Amanda Bird for joining us. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dave Bain, and this is Steve Winch in the Inception with Walk a Crooked Mile. <laughs>
Crooked Mile by Steve Winch in The Exception. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and it is time for us to head over to the York Shed now to catch up with Twangling Jack Ford for this week's album review. Rory Gallagher, Tattoo. Back in the early 70s, guitar heroes were not that common on the radio. Led Zeppelin did not release singles, so there was no Jimmy Page. Eric Clapton was a reclusive heroin addict, and Hendrix was no longer with us. The only band having hit singles with exciting lead guitar was Deep Purple. But these were rock gods with satin stage clothes like watered down glam, or dressed up like they were not dressed up, which was not that hard in the age of cheesecloth shirts and velvet loons. But there was this young Irish guy who dressed like his fans. I heard his song Laundromat. There must be nothing less exotic than a laundromat. He played a different kind of blues rock to those blues boomers that had had their day. There was something light and breezy about it, yet it seemed totally genuine. There was something quite Celtic about it. He was accessible, the guitar hero next door. He played at your local town hall, though I never saw him. When the album Tattoo came out, everyone thought it would make him a superstar. Tattooed Lady was catchy and quite poppy without compromising his signature sound. The album has folky blues, slide guitar and it seriously rocks. It has another of his best known songs a million miles away. And the bonus track is a country song. He had a great band and by the time he made this album he had recruited a keyboard player that could play the kind of boogie piano that added so much to Stevie Ray Vaughan's sound. The keyboard player also plays some excellent Hammond organ. I have a number of Rory Gallagher CDs, mostly because you can get five of them in a budget box set, but that does not include this album, which is an indication that it stands out as his best. I would also recommend the Storming Live album and film called Irish Tour. Rory Gallagher, Tattoo. Big thank you to Twangling Jack Ford for this week's album review. Thank you to Amanda Bird for being this week's guest. Thank you to everyone whose music I've shared. As always, you can find us on Facebook. If you search for The Art Show on Wickham Sound, you should be able to find us. You can email me here at the studio on dane.comain at wickhamsound.org.uk. That's D-A-N-E dot C-O-B-A-I-N at wickhamsound.org.uk. And if you missed an episode, we're repeating on Monday nights on Wickham Sound. We're on the Wickham Sound list again. We're on iTunes, Spotify, and wherever else you get your podcasts. And so... That's it for another week. I'm going to leave you with one last tune, and this is Robert Honor, previous guest on the show, with Prepare the Pipes. I'll see you next week. A moistened mattress from a fever dream. Unbridled panic, your dirty drama queen. A blood red sunrise reflects off an old guitar. You can run all you want to. But you won't get far A tortured poet Creative cocaine fiend Runs his yellow fingers Through 90s magazines His tinted glasses Disguise his absent gaze There's no sense in rushing He'll be for days Prepare the pipes and we'll be fine in your mind, in your mind, prepare the pipes and we'll be fine, numb in body and numb in mind, in your mind, in your mind, finally balanced by spoiled surprise. No, she can't be trusted, those shifty angel eyes. A backstreet banger, or a future queen. 
to those dirtied masses once washed but never clean. The eyes are rolling as you run inside. No, I can't console you. Prepare the pipes and we'll be fine. Now, me.